instead of me preach preaching, I just want to share with you for a, a time tonight and trust the Lord to enlarge your understanding and enlarge your vision and your heart. And, and what I really hope will happen, what I pray will happen, before you leave this building tonight, I hope you make a life-changing decision that you'll enjoy the salvation that God has blessed you with, that you'll celebrate the goodness of God, but that you'll never, never consume the blessings of God upon yourself. That one of your missions in life, one of your passions in life will be to share Jesus with somebody else who needs him just as bad as you did before you found him. And uh, I, if we can accomplish that, then it will have been a good day. We live up in Rockwall, and um, for several years, we attended Church on the Rock. We now attend, uh, uh, I don't attend much because I'm not home, but my family attends uh, Hillcrest. Uh, Pastor Mar Sheets is a friend of our family for many years, but several years ago, I was at Church on the Rock one Sunday morning, and um, one of those rare Sundays when I was home, and Pastor Lee preached a powerful evangelistic sermon, and there must have been a hundred people come down to the front, uh, just a real glorious move of God. And as these people stood down here waiting for ministry, Pastor Lee said to me and to several other preachers who were there, uh, come on down here and pray for these people. Well, I responded to that. I just walked down the aisle and uh, kind of mixed with this collection of people that were standing there. And I kind of spotted the seediest, um, most uh, dilapidated-looking couple uh, among the crowd. I mean, they were poorly dressed, very shabby. They were hard looking. Uh, you could tell they had been around the block a few times and uh, perhaps came with, with, there was no doubt about it, they came with many, many needs. I just reached out my hand as kindly and as gently as I knew how and I said to them as I took both of them, uh, took each of them by a hand, just kind of reached out to them. I said, what could I pray with you about today? And the man looked at me and said, Preacher, I ain't no good. He said, I ain't nothing. I'm not recommending this uh, type of uh, speech. I'm telling you what he said. He said, uh, uh, I ain't nothing but a Louisiana swamp rat. I'm sorry. I'm a big sinner. He said, I ain't never had a chance in life. He said, my daddy was a bootlegger. And he sponsored uh, rooster fights. And we lived down in the swamps in southern Louisiana where the Cajuns live. And every Friday night and all day Saturday and Sunday, the, people, the men would come for miles around and they'd buy this homemade liquor, and they'd get drunk as could be, and they'd gamble on the rooster fights. And uh, then they, they'd play Cajun music, and they'd dance. And then he said, when they got so drunk and so worked up, they usually wound up with somebody taking out a switchblade knife and cutting somebody up with it. And, and uh, he said, that's how I was raised. I was in that all my life as a child. He said, when I got grown, I was into drugs and liquor. And, and he said, uh, uh, I travel all over this country, all over the world. He said, I got a bunch of youngins, some of them by women I was married to and some of them by women I wasn't married to. And he said, um, uh, looked at his wife, and she's just seedy looking as he was. And she said, he said, she's just as sorry as I am. Uh, and, you know, I'm just standing there listening to all this with my eyes getting bigger by the minute. I thought, well, we may have war here. 
But she chimed in and said, he's telling you the truth. I'm just sorry as he is. And she lit out to tell me her sad story. And then that man said to me one of the most moving and profound and powerful things anybody's ever said to me. He said, Preacher, what I want you to pray with me about today is I want God to break this cycle of evil in my life. And I was so moved. I was moved to the depth of my being. And I took those two seedy-looking people who had confessed their own uh, dirty, low way of living to me without any hesitation. I took them in my arms and the tears poured down my cheeks. And I prayed a stronger prayer as I've ever prayed in my life for anybody that God would stretch forth his hand and God would intervene and God would break that ongoing, reoccurring cycle of evil in their lives. And I really believe God did something powerful for them th that morning. And if I didn't believe that God could do that, I'd quit preaching. I wouldn't even want to serve a God that couldn't do that. But I serve a God who can and does break the cycle of evil in people's lives. There's power in His name. There's power in His grace. There's power in His word. He's a living God. He's a compassionate God. He does search out men who need Him. And he responds to their cry. One thing I've learned about the Holy Spirit and the gift ministries is that the gifts of the Spirit should never be allowed to operate just to demonstrate that somebody has the gift. And that's one thing that's wrong with the charismatic movement now. We've tinkered with these holy things and we've trafficked in the sacred and we've played games with the supernatural and we've reduced it to common and ordinary when it's not common and ordinary. And we've made trash out of it and, and we've, we've brought ill repute on the name of the Lord by the way we tinker with these powerful and holy and sacred things. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be my age and be this far down the road. I don't have to gain brownie points with anybody. And the Lord is just uh, dealing with my heart to cry loud and spare not, but to cry loud in love. But, but we don't have to tinker with the holy. We don't have to monkey with that. But if I have learned anything about the ministry of the gifts, I have learned that the one thing the Holy Spirit responds to is human need. He doesn't respond to church people's egotism who want to put on a display and show everybody how spiritual they are. But what he does respond to is a seedy-looking character who will make his way to the house of God and somehow get down, himself down to the altar and in childlike faith reach out and say, pray for me that that cycle of evil will be broken. God responds to that kind. Praise God. He really does. And if... if if being in missionary work has taught us anything, if we have learned anything about God, we've learned that there is a supernatural dimension to Jehovah God, that when that supernatural power is brought to bear on human need, something has to give. God can break every fetter. He can kick the prison doors open. He can change a man. He can change a woman. Absolutely, totally, completely. If I ever learned anything when I was a pastor and I'd stand in that pulpit on Sunday morning, great faith would rise up in my soul. And I would just keep saying to myself, if I declare this good message, if I exalt Jesus, if I keep telling them how good God is and how wonderful He is and what a difference He can make, somebody's going to believe me. And somebody's going to get out of that balcony. Somebody's going to walk down these aisles. And somebody's going to meet Jesus today. And they did. They did. Praise God. Praise God. But if there's anything we've learned about God, we have learned 
that when the grace of God collides with human need, human need is met. And that's what missions is all about. I believe the same God that met that character out of the swamps of Louisiana on that Sunday morning, that same God can meet kids in, in the slums of Calcutta. That same, same God can invade a village in Africa and save the witch doctor. Praise God. That same God by His power and grace can penetrate a Muslim community and save people in spite of all their resistance to Christianity. That same God can invade a Buddhist temple and see the Buddhist priest become a pastor of a Christian church. I've seen it over and over again because God can break that cycle of evil. We have a Japanese friend who is more like a son than a friend who came into our lives when we pastored in Southern California. He worked as a custodian and maintenance man at our church for four years while he went to college, as he said, to study about the Holy Spirit. The last week he was with me, I discovered that he had a master's degree in nuclear physics. And he never said a word about it. And later he told me he learned much about the Holy Spirit as he swept my floor and cleaned my desk. And he became like a son to us. And now he works with us in missions. And he often travels with me when I go to India. And now he's going to Russia with me. And he heads the Rex Humbard television ministry in Japan, which Humbard's long since got old and feeble and bowed out. But Shioshi carries on what was started under the Humbard banner many years ago. And it's a powerful, effective ministry. And I had never heard Shioshi give his testimony. And I was out in India. And I said to the, to the uh, man who was hosting this conference where we were speaking, I said, I've never heard Shioshi really give his testimony, even though he worked with me for four years. But I suspect that your people will respond to an Asian better than they will an American. So why don't you have Shioshi speak this next service and ask him to give his testimony. And this very Japanese man, very typical Japanese, very reserved, very self, in much self-control, stood up. And his testimony was, I'm the elder son in my family. My father was a Buddhist priest. And his father was a Buddhist priest. And for 600 years, as far as we have any history of our family, the elder son of every generation became a Buddhist priest and presided over a temple. And I was the older son, and I was scheduled to become a Buddhist priest. And then I found myself sitting beside a Japanese young lady who was a Christian in college. And we went all the way through college together, and she witnessed to me every day. And eventually, she took me to church, and I was saved. And that cycle was broken. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We'll give the Lord a good hand and rejoice. And somehow or other, I want, to, I want you to get it in your heart and your mind that that evil can be broken. When you see a wine or a homeless person wandering around or a demented person or a drug addict, you just say to see yourself, that evil can be broken in that person's life. You see a girl selling her body on the streets in Dallas, you just say to yourself, there's power in the name of Jesus to make her clean and pure. Praise God. Praise God. I was out in the Philippine Islands a few months ago, and right out in front of our hotel, there was a witch doctor set up a little booth out there, and he was practicing his voodoo and his witchcraft on people as they passed. And he was actually taking a razor blade and draining blood out of the men who would stop. They'd stop, and he'd cut their arms or cut their earlobes and, and drain blood into a little cup, and then he'd sprinkle it around and mix it with some chicken flesh he was burning on a little fire. And, and uh, I mean, just pagan. I stood there and watched that guy, so demonized, so full of the devil. And it just rose up in me that Jesus can break that kind of bondage. Praise God. Praise God. He's able to do it. 
And we need to get it in our spirit that this is not an anemic Jesus we serve. He's a powerful Jesus. And he's in the business of changing people radically and wonderfully for his glory. Praise God. Love and I have been working in India for, I guess, nearly 20 years now. And it had been 17 years since Lovey had gone with me to India. I've been many times. And last year, as the, toward November, we thought we should go back to India. And, and we have about um, 800 children in India that we feed every day. And what we wanted to do is go before Christmas so we could take them all Christmas presents and, and personally deliver them. And uh, we needed to see it. See the children. We needed to see the workers. We needed to take care of business and make, make decisions. And I said to Levy, you know, you really ought to go this time. You, you work in this all day, every day. You really ought to go. And she uh, made her normal speech that we don't have enough money and uh, it costs too much and I need to go. But I said, well, you know, we ought to just believe God. We ought to just really trust God. And to make a long story short, the Lord supernaturally sent her uh, a ticket to go. The Lord really provided. Then our younger son, Darren, uh, found out we was going. And he said, oh, I'd just give anything if I could go. Because if I could go, I could take a, uh, make video pictures. And, and he wanted to do two things. He was graduating from Oral Roberts University. If he did this project, he would, that would be like his thesis. He could get a good grade and graduate and so on. And then we could have the video to show to people like you to demonstrate what we were doing. And he said, oh, I just want to go so bad. So his mother pipes up and said, uh, I'll just give him my ticket and he can go with you. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not what we prayed for. We prayed for the Lord to supply your ticket, and he did. It was your ticket, not Darren's, that God supplied. So if God wants Darren to go, he's going to have to do it again. So we just uh, really took a stand in prayer. And one day, right out of nowhere, this letter came from Montana, a couple that I'd only met once. I talked to him less than three minutes. And I'd mentioned that Darren wanted to use photography in missions work. And just in passing and gone, and we get this letter with almost exactly enough money to pay Darren's fare to India, saying that when you were here, you told us your son was going to use photography uh, to help you communicate what you're doing in missions. And uh, I don't. they said, we don't even know if we told you or not, but we are... are commercial photographers. We are master photographers, and we work in Yellowstone National Park. We take natural uh, scenes and animals and so on, and that's our life and our work, and we have a special understanding of the power of photography, and we just want to invest in your boy who they had never seen. We want to invest in his future ministry, and here's enough to let the kid go. So here we all go, all three of us off to India. And we got to Calcutta. I've been there many times. I knew a lot of the people. Love had been 17 years. And Dr. Mark Buntain is a legend in, in missions. And um, uh, we've been working with him and his ministry for 20 years. And Mark, uh, Dr. Buntain died last June. Just died. I mean, tragic. Fell dead with a heart attack. His wife is carrying on this work. I'm talking about, you're talking about mission work? 1,500 on the payroll. 20 churches, 60,000 children fed every day. A hospital, a nurses school, a school of theology, uh, a high school, 15 or 20 elementary schools. All functioning under, under this one mother church. And so we felt like the Lord sent us to minister to Sister Buntain. We, you know, her husband had been dead about four months and we're old friends and we show up. So she wanted me to preach on Sunday morning. She said, I'm not much of a preacher and 
And it just is such a blessing to have somebody come. And the church, you never saw a church like this. It's, um, the building is 10 stories high, and there's a church on every floor. It looks just like an office building, but there's a congregation on every floor. There's seven layers of people, seven congregations. They have church in seven different languages simultaneously. The top floor, the English service, that's where I speak, spoke. There's about 1,800 people. The next floor down is, is uh, Bengali, and the next one, Tamil, and, and so on. Distinct languages, but with a full pastoral staff, full music, uh, full everything done in each of those languages. When church was over, over 5,000 people boiled out of that building, and then that building, same building, is used for the high school during the week. And I'm on the platform getting ready to preach, enjoying all of this, See, rejoicing in the magnificent growth. It had grown a thousand percent since we first got acquainted with it and, and grieving a bit because of Mark's death and feeling sorry for her that she's got to carry this tremendous load. And this young Chinese guy is up leading singing. He's a he's short, stocky built Chinese type. He was born in Calcutta, but he's Chinese. So he's up going I mean, leading the singing, powerful worship, and very able, very effective. And Mrs. Buntain leaned over to me as sitting on the platform with her, and she said, uh, you know, uh, the young man who's leading the singing is a great preacher. He's been to Fuller in California. He's got a master's degree in theology. Uh, he's a natural-born leader. And since Mark died, he does most of the preaching. He's a powerful preacher. And she said, it's such a blessing to me. And then in an afterthought, she said, you know, he was one of the street killed kids when you were here first 17 years ago. He, we just found him on the street. And he would have probably starved to death if it hadn't have been for the ministry of the children. And I was just so moved. Here he is. You know, dress nice. He's first class in every respect. Uh, obviously moving toward becoming the pastor of that great church. Uh, a street kid whose body was covered with sores and his belly bloated and, and slept in an alleyway somewhere. And then Jesus came. Praise God. Praise God. And then... Uh, after the service, she took us and back through the offices. And here's a young Indian man. And she introduces us as the business. To him, he said, he's the business manager. He said, when your offerings come, he's the one that gets it. He puts it in the bank. He deposited it. She said, our budget here, we have to have $360,000 a month from the states uh, to keep everything rolling here. And he takes care of all of that. He issues the receipts. He he manages all the business. And we started out of the door, and she said, and come to think of it, he was one of those street kids. Praise God. And that night, I went and preached again, and this time another young fellow is up leading and singing, and she leans over and says, he's a youth pastor. He's got about 600 teenagers he's responsible for. And he's doing a great job. And she said, and he was one of those kids too. And the next day when we went to the hospital, we met the assistant administrator. And she said, and he was one of those kids too. <laughs> then we went to the school of nursing. And they have about 25 or 30 of the sharpest young ladies from all over India. They're studying to be uh, nurses. And all the trophies on the wall. And Ms. Buntain says, you know, our girls make the highest scores of any girls in the nation. They walk off with all the honors every year for their achievement in, in medical, in the medical realm. And she said, these are the cream of the crop. For the, not just our church, but the whole of India. And she said over two-thirds of them were urchins, beggar kids that would have died on the streets 
if guys like you hadn't come by to help us. Praise God. Praise God. I want to tell you there's power in that name, Jesus. And we, we just, we just, we left there feeling at least 10 feet tall. Every now and then you just need to look around and say, it does work. You know, you read the bad reports in the paper. The media is always chasing a preacher and, and giving a bad report. And Christians fail and. Some kind, sometimes the church it looks like the laughing stock of the community, and, and the devil mocks and 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 just kind of celebrates our weakness. And if we're not careful, we'll get to looking around, and we'll get to swallowing all that garbage, and we'll get to uh, feeling crushed by all of the failure and all the shortcoming. Man, you may not be able to go to Calcutta with with us and see that quantum leap those kids took but I'll tell you one thing you can just look around and I'll guarantee you in this room tonight there's somebody here that was no better off than that guy that stood in front of me as bound a slave to sin but Jesus came and he broke that cycle of evil and he's still in business and he's still doing his wonderful work tonight praise God praise God And that's why we have to go to the ends of the earth. That's why we can't settle down here and say it's just us four and no more. We have to get beyond these walls. Man, I walk, I walk the streets of the great cities of the world like Bangkok. And I see the sin and the debauchery. And I see those little old kids begging. And their bodies covered with sores and their stomachs swollen twice the size they ought to be. And I said, if somebody can tell this kid about Jesus, if this kid can get a hold of, of the grace of God, there's no telling who he'll be or what he'll be. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You don't have to go to Calcutta or Bangkok. You can go to Dallas. You can go right here in your own town and see what sin has done. But you never want to wallow in the failure. What you want to do is look around and see that God wins more than He loses. Praise God. Praise God. And He's still in business right now in this community, still working. Praise God. I want to lift up my eyes and I want to see what God can do. I want to celebrate the goodness of Jesus. Praise God. Years ago, I went to the Fiji Islands to preach a at a convention. Now, since we don't go to the Fijis every day, maybe I ought to tell you where they are. Uh, uh, you go to Honolulu and change planes and fly toward Australia about eight hours. And if the pilot's figuring it right, you'd come to the Fijis. <laughs> if he doesn't, you're, you're in, in for a real dunking because that's a big ocean. Uh, the Fijis are about 300 islands. Uh, uh, about 25 different languages. And I'm preaching to this big crowd of preachers in this great church. And we're having a great time. And you know, all preachers have to eat after church. You know, that's part of our religion. Is once we preach, once we do our thing at church, then we got to go eat. And have you found that out about preachers? Uh, is pastor any different? No, no. Uh, and that just goes with the territory. This is work up here. And after work, you're supposed to eat. Uh, and good religion and good food go together. That's why preachers are always overweight and, and having huge problems like that. But uh, so uh, uh, keeping with our tradition, we went out to eat. We went to a little Chinese restaurant, just a hole in the wall. And... Uh, I ought to tell you a little about Fiji. That night, a choir of men, a hundred men, had sang the Holy City a cappella. The smallest guy in that choir was probably six foot four. I mean, these guys are giants. When the missionaries came, they not only were cannibals, they were naked. And the missionaries uh, didn't have time to make trousers for all of them, so they just 
uh, rip off a piece of cloth off of a, a bolt of cloth about three yards and they taught the guys to wrap it around themselves and now still millions of men wear what they call lava lavas or, or zulus and the on sunday morning uh, the preachers go to the pulpit they wear a tie and a shirt and a coat and a skirt the skirts tailor made they may be barefooted they may not but these guys are giants they're huge guys and I said to the pastor while I was down there, I said, do you ever wear trousers? And he said, sometimes on Saturday when I don't think the saints will see me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, But uh, uh, we're sitting there eating in this little Chinese restaurant with these big black guys with, you know, with a big natural afro, and they're giants. And the, and the, uh, one of the missionaries, one of the, American missionary said to me, said, you know why, Brother the Cow, that is the senior pastor, the leader of this great church and this great revival movement, said, you know why he's such a great preacher? And I waited. I knew there was, you know, something was coming. And he said, because his grandfather helped eat a missionary. And that missionary won't be quiet. The, uh, the missionary is standing up to talk. And and this is all a gruesome, uh, distasteful joke, you know. And and I thought, so uh, I I you know was grinning at this missionary telling this gruesome thing and and kind of teasing at my host. And my host, uh, the Fijian, punched me and said, "You think he's teasing, don't you?" And I said, "Well, I sure hope he is." And he said, "No, my forefathers were cannibals." And a Methodist missionary came here, and my grandfather and some other men killed him and boiled him and ate him. And I remember it. I was there. I was six years old. And he said, uh, uh, he's not teasing. He said, that really happened. And later I invited that same man to my church to preach, and he brought, brought a war club. And when he came to the pulpit, he gave me the war club as a gift. I have it hanging in my office now. And he said to the congregation, said, my forefathers killed each other with clubs like this and boiled each other's flesh and ate it. But then the gospel came. Praise God. Praise God. Then the gospel came. And after that kind of gross episode in that restaurant that night with him telling me this, and I find out it really wasn't a joke. The guy was telling the truth. He was stretching a little bit, maybe about the old missionary preaching. But uh, uh, the next morning, that man who was the grandson of a cannibal went to the pulpit and preached to a congregation of 1,800 people. He had over 200 outstation services going simultaneous. Down the road, there's a high school with 1,200 students. The other way, there's a Bible school with 55 men training for the ministry. And that congregation has, has started now over 400 churches in the last 20 years, scattered over all over the South Pacific. And that man preached as powerful a sermon as I've ever heard. He preached in English, which is his second language. And there was a Fijian interpreting in Fijian and an Indian translating for the Indian population simultaneous. And that man ordained 32 new ministers to the gospel that morning. The grandson of a cannibal. And I sat on that platform and cried like a baby. I mean, the tears poured. I couldn't control myself. And I kept saying to myself, Savelle Phillips, you are seeing it firsthand. In that man's lifetime, he saw a missionary boiled and eaten. And now he's in the pulpit preaching a powerful Christ-exalting message. And he laid hands on 32 men and ordained them to the ministry that morning. I want to tell you that cycle of evil can be broken. That cycle of evil can be broken. It has been broken in my life. Glory to God. Glory to God. And I just keep saying to myself, if I can get out there and tell people about Jesus, the same thing's going to happen to them. If I can get to these tribes in New Guinea, and we're, we're trying to get into China now in a new way, and we're, we're opening up some new 
territory in Africa to people who have never, never had the scriptures. I just keep saying to myself, if we can get there and we can brag on Jesus and do it loud and long, somebody is going to believe the good report. Praise God. Let's just have a little fun here tonight. I don't want to embarrass anybody. You don't have to respond if you don't want to. Uh, but for the glory of God, do we have any ex druggies here? You were hooked on drugs before Jesus came. Anybody? Anybody? What about? Oh, here we are. I knew we had at least one. Uh, and, and, and we don't want to embarrass anybody, but what about alcohol? Any of you have a problem with that? You don't have any problem anymore? Praise God. Something supernatural had to break that. It wasn't a matter of your will. It wasn't a matter of somebody giving you a good New Year's resolution. Jesus had to come and break that chain. Anybody here have a problem with a bad temper before you got saved? Right over here? Woo, it's a good thing you two didn't get together. Uh, Jesus broke that thing in he didn't. Praise God. Praise God. Well, we could just keep going with this. I know when I was a pastor, I'd get tired and weary and discouraged sometimes. And you know, the best cure in the world for me was to sit on the platform on Sunday morning while the choir and the musicians sang and do a visual scan of the congregation. And that would sit Brother Crosby with his arm around Sister Crosby. And when I first met them, they were drunks. And they lived in a shack and sat on a nail keg. They didn't even have a chair. And now there he is sitting in the church with his arm around his wife. He's got on a nice suit. He's got on a, he's beautifully dressed. His wife is dressed. They live in a brick house and there's two cars sitting in the driveway. And they put a nice offering in this morning. And only Jesus could take the town drunk and move him around like that. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. I, I remember sitting on the platform in my church in California. I just sit there and see. What a mess this couple was when I first met them. What a, what a scrambled head that person had. What an unbelievable lifestyle. And we had one young girl showed up. Uh, first time I met her, she came to my office uh, bleeding. Uh, her back had been lacerated. Uh, and the blood was, her shirt, her blouse was just cut all to pieces. And she was screaming and telling me that, her daddy, her own dad had tried to rape her and, and had cut her with a razor. And, and, and at first my heart went out to her and I got my secretary and my secretary took her into the ladies room and we cleaned her up and, and the secretary brought her back out and I'm praying with her and I'm trying to minister to her. And God said to me, she's telling you a lie. That never happened to her. She's lying to you. Just like that. The Holy Spirit said that. And she's crying and wailing and carrying on. And it's a bad scene. And, and we would work with her, I guess, an hour when the Holy Spirit said to me, she's lying to you. And I stopped her in all this hysterical carrying on. And I said, Martha, why would you tell me a lie? She said, what do you mean? I said, you lied to me. Nobody's attacked you. You did this to yourself. And she screamed. She said, how did you know? And when I got to the bottom of it, that girl was actually demon possessed. There was a demonic power that drove her. And she said, you know, I was a biological accident. I was an unwanted child. I've been a reject all my life. And I learned early in life that if I'd cut myself and bleed, people would notice me. And she said, nobody's ever found me out before, but you found me out. And I did it to get attention because I knew if I came here, just an ordinary person, you wouldn't pay me any attention. But she said, I, I, I was willing, I'd rather bleed than to be ignored. It was pathetic. Unbelievable. And I wrestled and prayed with that situation. And over months... And, and God delivered her. I mean, he sovereignly delivered her.
She's married to a pastor now. Got three children. Doing great. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. We don't want to ever lose sight of the fact that those chains can be broken. That there's victory in Jesus. Let's just stand to our feet and celebrate what God has done in our lives. Praise God. Take new courage. Enjoy what the Lord has done for you. If you never were into those deep things, thank God that by His grace He, he kept you from being in it. I've been saved since I was a child. I never drunk my life. I never smoked but one cigarette. My mother caught me. And I want to tell you now, she declared war on my backside. I don't know where Jesus delivered me and my mother. But that's about as deep in sin as I ever got. I told a fib or two. But I needed to be kept. And that's a miracle too. Everybody just come on up here and let's stand right, right here in the front. I want to pray over you. I want us to rejoice over the goodness of God. Would you come on? Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you've got somebody in your family that's bound and there's demonic activity in their life, I want you to remember that cycle of evil can be broken. If you live next door to a neighbor that there's such manifestation of evil in their life, I don't want you to ever forget that God can break that thing in their life. Praise God. Praise God. He's a miracle working God. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just raise your hands and worship God? Tell Him how much you love Him. How much you appreciate what He's done in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we can remember and think about how good you are and how powerful you are in behalf of men. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you saved our souls. That you broke the bondage. That you lifted the curse. That you set us free. Praise God. Now, I want you to pray with me about something that really concerns me. The man who's doing the work is 67 years old. He has leukemia. He sleeps an hour or two and works an hour or two and in effect works and sleeps around the clock because of his physical condition. They have already finished Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's ready to be printed. This man said to me, I asked him how I could help and how I could um uh, be a blessing to them and encourage them. And his helper, the language helper, is a young Chinese lady, 24 years old. She teaches at a university. She teaches English. Her name is Lisa. And this elderly gentleman leaned across the table and said, I'll never live to finish this New Testament. He said, it's going to be her responsibility to finish it. And he said, she's bright She's godly. She's anointed. She's capable. But she's never had any training. And he said, the best thing in the world you can do is to get her out of here and take her to the States and, and let her be trained to be a Bible translator. I got a letter from her last week. She's passed three of the four final hurdles to get the communist government to give her a passport. We're praying for that final yes. When she 
gets here, she's going to attend school at the Assemblies of God School here in Waxahachie. And I want you to get acquainted with her, and I want you to be friends to her. I want you to have her in her home, in your homes, because she's not going to have any family or any friends. And she'll be here for about a year, maybe two years, and then she'll go up to Duncanville where she'll study at the University of Texas. And in about three years, she'll go home to take over finishing that Bible for a tribe of several hundred thousand people. Could you just kind of remember her name is Lisa? And join me in prayer that God will, will give her a passport and help her to get permission to leave the country. And then I'm going to have to have $11,000 to pay her way through school. Like in 30 days. And, and you can pray with me about that. But one of the, and, and that's urgent. But one of the things I want her to do is have some spirit-filled people that will take her in when she lives in this community. Amen. Can you remember that? Can you have her to your house to eat and maybe spend the weekend and just show her Christian love and show her American love? Amen. Wouldn't that be neat? Praise God. You can get in touch with our office. We can arrange it. We can help you meet her. Her name is Lisa. She's really a charming young lady. She speaks excellent English. She'll be a delight and a joy. Can we pray for Lisa right now? Pray that the communist anti-God government that would like to destroy the Jesus in her and hinder her, they're hid out. They're doing this work secretly. If the police find them, she'll be arrested. But I believe God's able. Amen. Amen. Let's reach all across America and all across the Pacific to China. She lives in Kuning, China. Let's pray for Lisa right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for Lisa. We pray that you would minister to her comfort and protection and provision right now, this minute. God, we know that the devil would like to roar against her and destroy her. She's already the victim of persecution. But you can cause those government officials, even if you have to confuse them, you can cause them to put that stamp in her passport. You can cause them to open the border and let her come out. We ask you to give us a good word that she's been allowed to come to America. Let that word come this next week. And when she gets here to study, to finish her degree work, let this be a pleasant place for her to live. Let her have a good experience. And lay it on the hearts of some of the people in this church to love her and to be family to her. Praise God. Praise God. And God, release the money. You can lay it on the hearts of 11 people to give $11,000. You can send it in in hundreds and fifties, but you can make a way. Glory to God. Praise God. And if you get to thinking about how Jesus can break this cycle of evil and you, you'd really like to touch somebody in India, the Philippines, or Africa. We're your link between you and those people. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Love has got some pictures of those kids out there if you want to choose one of them and you want to sponsor. She'd be tickle pink if you did that tonight. Praise God. Hadn't it been a good day in the house of the Lord? Why don't you just give the Lord a big hand and celebrate His goodness?